Paul Clay is a master of the grid, and for this reason, he is one of my go-to artists when I'm coaching composition. He is a true picture maker. Clay's example is especially useful for students who want to learn how to avoid what I call the missing background problem. Clay shows us how the three key elements of a picture, its subject, the open space around the subject, and the edges of the picture, are all connected to each other in the eye of a picture maker. When we look at his paintings, we see that no matter what the main subject is, it might be a landscape, an arrangement of symbols, a pure abstract picture, or a picture of people or creatures. In each picture, everything is organized according to a grid structure. Everything, the positions of the details, the scale of the objects, and the distribution of colors and light and dark values. What do you think? Is Paul Clay one of the best artists to study when learning composition design? Or are there other artists who give us better insights about composition and the grid, and especially how to solve the problem of the blank background? Let me know what you think in the comments below. And if you're new to my channel, don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you get all my latest art ideas and lesson tips. The missing background problem is something students often experience as they transition towards observational drawing and painting. And then, if they try to add a background afterwards, it doesn't always work. In fact, in many cases, students feel they have ruined their picture by trying to add a background. How and why does this happen? And how can we fix this problem? The only way we can solve this problem is to learn a new artistic behavior, a picture-making behavior. A picture-making mindset that enables us to imagine and plan an edge-to-edge -edge picture even when we are only interested in the object or the person that we want to draw or paint. The first thing is to not be too tough on ourselves if we make this so-called mistake. We are so focused on just trying to get the shape the proportions, tones, and 3D character of the object or person correct, that we forget everything else. It's a kind of tunnel vision. This is quite normal. We do not need to correct this way of drawing. We need to add to it. The first additional step is right at the start. That moment when we choose the paper we are going to draw on or paint on, and when we decide where on the paper to start drawing or painting. Right at this moment, before we get sucked down into the tunnel vision of studying the object or person extremely closely, we need to pause and imagine our finished drawing on the paper and ask ourselves, how much space do we want around the object? Because we will be doing something in that space. The second additional step comes at some stage during the actual drawing of the object or the person. At some moment, when you feel a drawing of the object or the person is coming together or shaping up well, but not yet complete, step back. Look at the empty shapes and think about what you want to start doing with them to connect them to the object or person and to connect the object or person somehow to the edges of the picture. This is when you need to be able to visualize some options. This is the truly new thing you need. You need to find some new picture making experience and that experience will give you a menu of options. Now there are many ways that other artists solve this problem. So let's have a look at just a very few examples. Let's look at Wayne Thiebaud. The way he does it with his cake paintings and his other paintings of people or objects is through the luscious paint surfaces. He uses the same paint application treatment, the same thickness of paint and visible brush strokes, whether it's in the space around the object or the object itself. Now for a completely different approach, look at Alice Herbst's paintings. What she does 
is creates lots of activity in the space around the figures that she paints. She does create a scene, but the way she does this is by photoshopping a montage of other images, and then she uses that as the basis for creating a very busy space, a textured space. My sixth grade students in these examples started with a line drawing of a figure seated on a chair, intentionally with lots of space around the figure. And then they searched for lines on the figure itself or on the chair that they could extend out to the edge of the picture. This created a web of connections between the figure and the edge before they added color. Now that approach is quite similar to the technique we can learn from today's artist, Paul Clay. Paul Clay uses two basic methods. First, he draws a grid of pencil lines that links all parts of the picture from side to side and top to bottom. Secondly, he paints every space in this grid, often with transparent watercolors, using color contrasts, hue contrasts, and color accents to emphasize the details that are most important to him. Then it is almost as if the details of the drawing or the painting are emerging out of a unified space or environment composed of colors and lines. To make our practice activities simple today, we are taking one subject that Paul Clay sometimes used, lettering. In this example, he has embedded the words of a poem in his grid of lines. See how each letter touches the line above and the line below, so even the letters become part of the grid and they create their own geometric patterns. We are going to use lines, letters and colours, just like Paul Clay, to practice this technique now. Warm-up activity one types of grids. Make several small playful grids to find out the types of grids you like. Use evenly spaced straight lines, unevenly spaced lines, curved or wavy lines, bold lines, nervous skittish lines. Fill one or two pages with lots of experiments. Warm up activity two, types of lettering. Doodle and play with different types of lettering that you can draw with lines. Create letters that might suit being placed in a grid. Make different types of letters that have open spaces inside them that you could later fill with color. Activity three, let's put the two together. That is, now let's put a grid and a series of letters together. You will need an HB or a B pencil Plus, you're going to need good art paper, for instance, a watercolour paper, because in the next stage, when you add colour, your paper needs to be thick enough and strong enough to take watercolours or layered brush markers without the paper surface wrinkling and warping or breaking up. What letters or words are you going to experiment with? You could simply use the alphabet, or you could choose or compose a short poem or a slogan, or use your family's names or a series of numbers. Activity four, add color. We're going to add color to the lettering grid that you just created with your pencils. For this, you need transparent colors. For example, you could use watercolors or good quality brush markers, or color inks applied with brushes, or aquarelle pencils or color pencils. The idea is to use the lines and the patches of color together to create the expressive structure of the composition. It's important to treat this as a playful experiment because this helps you discover your own color grid style or language. Advanced level activity five. Try this advanced activity whenever you feel ready to use Paul Clay's grid and patches of color technique in your own way, in your own style, and with your own free choice of subject. 
To really test this technique out for yourself, choose any subject you wish that doesn't already come with a background. Of course, you can use this technique with a scene like a landscape or a drawing of an interior like your room or the classroom. But to start with, it's good to test out your creativity with some freestanding subject where you must create the space around it. Try a portrait or a figure study or an object or a small still life or a freestanding building or tree. Create a harmonious structure, a harmonious interconnection of object lines and grid lines that extend all the way to the four edges of the paper.